You know something? I'm really glad that you brought this back around because I've had quite a few people ask me about this in the past. From Boxier Gaming, he says, what's the difference between vampire servants like Vlad or Elizabeth and dead apostles? So here's the thing with this one. Vampires that you see in the Nosiverse usually carry the title of being a bloodsucker. In this case, they have this feverish desire for brutality. Some of the most common examples that you see come up time and time again is Vlad and Carmilla. The label is something that you can derive from their background as they become a heroic spirit. Vlad was often thought to be one of the most brutal leaders of mankind. Whether that be true or false, many of the people that went against him would often speak about him specifically for his carnage just for the sake of him doing so. The thousands and thousands of people that he impaled, the innocent civilians who were trampled in the meantime, the guerrilla warfare tactics that he used to keep the upper hand. Truth be told, Vlad didn't give a fuck. All of which would be the things that would later earn him the title of the mythical Dracula. So if you're wondering why Vlad is a vampire, he's literally where the legend of Dracula comes from. That same fiendish pursuit for blood that he had is what formed the myth. And we've covered Vlad's entire lore on the channel years ago. And then going over to Carmilla, going back to her lore, she was wealthy, she was a noble, and there were many times where people would end up on her estate and then they would never be seen again. Again, come to find out that there were rumors of her having a torture chamber. She would bathe in the blood of all of her victims. She felt like this was something that kept her young and fresh. She would turn them into servants, all types of weird and specific things. That's the reason she earned the title as vampire as Carmilla. A few instances where you can see these things in action, looking at Carmilla, she has this huge nail coffin as a part of her phantasm that she traps her victims in and she penetrates them and literally drains the blood. That's actually her special move. And then when it comes to Vlad, when he was introduced in Fate Extra, he has an alternative form that leans more towards that Dracula side, more so than his historical version, Vlad III, where you see he's bloodied up as opposed to the original Vlad that doesn't like these rumors being spread about him. Extra Vlad is fully aware of these things and he takes it all in with no regret. So there's that. Now, when it comes to a Elizabeth, and I've mentioned this before, she is the younger version of Carmilla who doesn't want to go down that blood sucking path. They've actually had interactions with each other in the story. They fought each other in the first chapter of FGO in Orleans. Elizabeth, her younger self, basically fights for the right not to turn evil. All of that being said, even Elizabeth has some of those characteristics in her kid. And then there's the incident with Vlad the Third and Faith apocrypha where he transformed into a completely different being entirely this happened strictly because he ended up fusing with his master darnik and darnik forced him to tap into his mythical side the real vlad actually hates this side of himself but once darnik got in there was no way for vlad to really stop him now a lot of people have asked me about this vlad and apocrypha was he really a dead apostle no though you can say that he's for sure dead apostle level the not novel categorizes him as just an extremely powerful vampire. The truth of the matter is, he really turned into Dracula himself, if you couldn't already tell from how strong he was. As I mentioned in my Don't Sleep, this dude was going against six servants, multiple of them being high tier at the same time. Achilles, Chiron, Karna, and he was dog walking every single one of them. Not only that, but Joan was helping them out also, and she's a ruler. This motherfucker got shot in the eye, amputated, burned alive, and he was laughing. The man was tanking lightning, eating command spells, up until a point nothing was working, and it took an entire exorcism from Amakusa to actually take him down. And it just goes to show, and we've discussed this a bit in the comments as well, there's a a lot of missed opportunity by not using Dracula as a focal point to a fate story. Because though he was in the story, it wasn't necessarily about him. Because you gotta think, everybody knows Dracula. Even if you don't know Dracula, you know Dracula. It's kinda like King Arthur. You may not know who King Arthur is specifically, but you've at least heard of the name. It's like, oh, King Arthur, Knights of the Round, Sword in the Stone, Excalibur. Dracula is the same way. He's the 
pinnacle of mythology. He's mythology incarnate. That's the reason why he was so powerful in the first place, because of those ties. Remember, that plays a huge part into their strength. Now going back to the base of the discussion, does this mean that every brutal person in history is a vampire? No, but it is usually somebody of that nature, and most importantly, they've had these rumors spread around their name to form that connection. You have other characters from the verse that fall under the same category. Bab and Sith and Hinako, for example. So for Bab and Sith, something that we come to find out about her is that she loves to torture. And a lot of this comes from LB6, where you would see that her and Burl had their own select torture sessions where they would bring people in and she would try to use different mystic codes and items on them just for the sake of doing so, just to see how long they would last. And she hates sunlight. So you can see why fate wise, she also has those desires. And just like before, she really doesn't want them to be revealed. As we saw when Castoria beat her in a 1v1 and exposed who she truly was in myth, it really ruined her because the people found out about her real image. In the story, she puts on the facade of Fairy Knight Tristan, but in her background, Babin Sith is somebody that showed up, drained people of their energy, and then took their lives. And that draining specifically is heavily focused on that lust for blood. When it comes to Hinako, she's one of the focal characters from part two FGO. Initially, she was introduced as a human. She was one of the cryptors, a person that was experienced enough to fight and protect the world. What we later come to realize is that she too is a vampire with shape-shifting capabilities. That her real name wasn't Hinako, it was actually Yume. And in reality, Yu is an existence that's closer to a true ancestor. Briefly hitting on true ancestors, they are the highest level of a vampire that you can be. They're higher than vampires, bloodsuckers, dead apostles, everybody. Arkaway is a true ancestor, for example. Now, since Yu isn't an actual true ancestor, and she's just a being that's close to it, we never really got to find out where her true powers lie because of that lack of exhibition. At the very best, we found out that she went up against a prominent Magus through the El Malloy series. But we do know that she loves blood. You can see this as a part of her phantasm. She eats humans and she hates humans as a collective. But the hate that she has for humans is more so on a biological level than it is political. I will say there's a lot of room for evolution with her character, but just like I mentioned before with Vlad, they kind of just forgot about her and she ends up being a prop. And she's not the only one. It's a common thing that happens in FGO. I remember back in Salem when we met the traveling gentleman and it's never outright stated, but this is actually HP Lovecraft himself. If you read the chapter and you understood how it worked, it doesn't really need to be said. But yeah, they entertained the idea of coming back to him and many of the aliens in the verse and then they kind of just don't do anything with it. It's just one of those things. Now, one of the unique existences in the verse that falls in the category of both a bloodsucker and a dead apostle is Scion. Scion, for one, right now is labeled as a bloodsucker, but she's not outright stated to be a vampire yet. There's a part in the story where she almost called herself a vampire outright, and then she realized it wasn't time to reveal that yet, so she starts to switch up her words, and she just says that she has abilities that's similar to Yume, who we just covered. So if that doesn't say it, I don't know what will. Personally, I think she's going to be revealed to be a dead apostle later. There's been a lot of build up to her character for her doing so, her lack of involvement. It would just make sense. Plus, there's the fact that in the Tsukihime world where she comes from, before she was retooled and put into fate, she was an actual dead apostle with specific dead apostle abilities. She got turned by her ancestor, Wallachia. And what's really cool about her is that she can intertwine her abilities as an alchemist with her abilities of being a dead apostle. So she's making clones. She has energy wave projectiles that are specific to her. She intertwines her abilities with her use of the black barrel replica while still maintaining those original vampiric aspects. And of course, she has the curse of restoration, something that's specific to being a dead apostle. Your body itself is turning time back to the point before you were harmed. So not only are you healing, but you're actually reversing any damage that you took in general. It's actually better 
better than healing. So they essentially have limited immortality. They're way harder to kill than any of the average foe that you might think of, even on a lower scale. And we've got some that are like 4,000 years old that we haven't even come into contact with yet. So I can't wait until Nasu starts to release those. And then you have this specific gray area of bloodsuckers who aren't exactly vampires or dead apostles. They're just bloodsuckers. So they just have that pursuit for blood. That's not to say that they couldn't get a vampire role later on in the story, but they haven't really been labeled as such as of right now. Akiha Tono and the Gorgon sisters are some of the people that come to mind. So to get off into Akia, if you watched my recent video where I covered the mystic eyes of death and I was talking about Shiki Tono, I mentioned how Shiki Tono isn't actually a Tono and he originally comes from a completely different family known as the Nanias. Akiha is his sister in that family that he ended up with. She's an actual Tono by blood and the thing with the Tonos is that they have a background of being Onis. They're mixed blooded demons. So taking that into account, she has that same lust and pursuit for blood as a vampire without actually being one. This coupled with the fact that she does have some really cool abilities as a part of her kit. She can manipulate blood itself. She can make weapons out of it. She can use it to heal. She can turn it into disc projectiles or use it to imbue herself entirely and go into a full out transformation. Her hair even changes to the color of blood when she's doing so. And the reason why her ability to manipulate is so heavy is that you could hit her, blood shoots out of her body, and she uses that against you too. So even going against her is almost like going against yourself. And that's really just scratching the surface of her character. And then for the Gorgon sisters, I'll use Medusa as an example. And there's plenty of scenes where you can catch her doing this. If you remember the alleyway back in Heaven's Field, when Medusa was sucking the blood of the random girl, this was actually Ayako Mitsuzuri, the leader of Shiro and Sakura's archery team. You have the dream sequence where Medusa was trying to find ways to get energy for Sakura. That same sequence where the infamous meme comes from, her anus is defenseless, that's where that originated. And she has a full blown out sex scene with Shiro, but while she's doing this, she's actually getting a lot of the energy by sucking his blood. She was biting into his neck. And you can tell that this is actually Medusa and not Ren because of her eyes. You can see it. She has a completely different pair. So she's done it there. And even in the bad ends, you have the fate route where Shiro came into contact with Medusa and he had the choice whether he should call Saber for help or try to take Medusa on himself. In the bad end, he decides to take her on himself and she ends up biting into his flesh and draining his entire body of blood completely right then and there. Now for the dead apostles, they're a completely different vein. And we've covered this in great detail in my dead apostle hierarchy video. It's at least 45 minutes long. The dead apostles in particular are a subspecies of vampires that come from another one of Nasu's works, Tsukihime. They work their way back around into fate later on down the road. I'm sure you guys remember their appearance in Kirisugu's flashback where his entire home island was overrun by these apostles. So we've seen them appear there. You have introductions like the shapeshifter known as Jester that we've seen in Strange Fate or even the involvement of one of the dead apostles that I've mentioned recently who is Van Fim, a dead apostle ancestor that's been alive for at least two millenniums. As I'm sure you can already tell, the dead apostles are way more complicated with their roles and their desires than just your normal vampire. There's at least 10 ranks in their hierarchy. The foot soldier dead apostles, like the ones that you see in Kirisugu's flashback, are really no more than zombies. But the actual dead apostles with the conscience and the dead apostle ancestors have some heavy political ties and abilities that distinguish each one from the next. When it comes to the dead apostle ancestors, they're some of the highest in the dead apostle chain. They've either been around the longest or they've somehow worked their way up the ladder through their efforts. And I make no exaggeration when I say this, none of them are the same. You got one ancestor that has an authority over temperature, that's Vlav. You got another that has an authority over chaos, that's Nero. You have another ancestor that's literally a forest that can put you in a continuous spell of pain and suffering. And then you got another 
another ancestor that's literally an alien spider from outer space who later ended up being retooled as one of the greatest enemies in fate period so yeah the dead apostles get wild the ancestors get wild and that's why i'm happy to be putting people on to them because every dead apostle is a vampire but not every vampire is a dead apostle so it's good to know the difference but all in all every vampire is a child of the crimson moon the crimson moon is the king of vampires himself and let me just clear this up while i'm here because in the past i mentioned zell wretch ends up being a dead apostle because he got bit by the crimson moon in the Tsukuhime world and a lot of people were like how does he get bit by a moon the crimson moon is a metaphysical location it's just one of his interpretations when he doesn't have a true physical form we've still yet to see what he really looks like so until he comes out in his humanoid version we just know him to be a moon but that's not what he really looks like but i'm sure nasu thought that this probably confused people so instead of saying that the moon bit them he turned back around in the remake and said that zell rich was bit by one of his children so it makes more sense but i've always felt like that's what it meant from the start man that line probably had people thinking this was looney tunes like the moon itself had a mouth and bit him and if you really think about it since the crimson moon has authority over all vampires that means that he can possess any one of them and we've seen this firsthand from the melty blood manga when he possessed arcaway and he came to us in her body so when you think about the crimson moon actually biting somebody i'm sure it's just him taking over the body of one of his children and using them to do the body it just flows together naturally also the crimson moon is not the regular moon because i've seen people conflate that people think the moon cell is on the crimson moon and the crimson moon is the regular moon we still have a regular moon the crimson moon when he isn't in a humanoid body is interpreted as its own moon and then the moon cell is in a completely different world where the crimson moon isn't present so they all have their independent thing going and then as far as how you turn usually a dead apostle is a person that was researching magecraft and they knew their life would eventually come to an end so they turned themselves into a dead apostle to further that research and not have to worry about their age getting in the way or another way that you can turn is just outright being bitten by somebody else in other words becoming someone else's descendant and of course that's a whole video in and of itself 